on camera. Today is May the 11th, 2018. My name is Roger Soyset. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. With me is Frank Lutton, also a volunteer at the History Center, and Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Harry Douglas Allen, Jr., who served in the U.S. Army during the Cold War. Uh, Mr. Allen's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center, the Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. Honored to have you with us today, Mr. Allen, and we want to thank you for participate, participating in the project. Uh, to begin, would you please state your full name and date of birth? Harry Douglas Allen, Jr., February the 12th, 1928. And where did you begin your life and how did we uh, come to... Well, I was born about a mile from here down Peachtree at uh, right next to Christ the King Cathedral. There's a street called Peachtree Way. And right down there, about two blocks down, is where I was born. My both grandparents lived there on Lakeview Avenue, which is another block s south on Peachtree. And that's, they built that house 1919, and, and that's mm -hmm. where I was born. That's where my mother and dad met each other, being neighbors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not one of these immigrants here. Uh, <laughs> I'm from California myself. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that's all right. That's, <laughs> I've heard, I've met some pretty nice people from California. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your early life before you uh, got into the military? Oh, okay. My dad worked for Western Union, and we traveled quite a bit. He got transferred quite a bit throughout the southeast. Uh, and first, he, he and my wife, my mother divorced when I was 10 months old right there, and where I'm talking about down the street. And he, uh, they, he remarried when I was three and a half years old, and I was raised by the stepmother to think that was my mother. And I was age 14 when I discovered by accident, ran across some papers that she was not my mother, but my stepmother. I knew we didn't, we weren't marching to the same music. Uh, she didn't like classical music, and I did. She didn't read at all, and I read everything I could get my eyes on. And uh, so anyway, I started out, and I could, I went to a total of 10 schools by the time I finished high school, uh, here in Atlanta and Louisville, Kentucky, Richmond, Virginia, twice. New York, Long Island, New York, and uh, I always thought that was a big adventure to travel and go to new schools, and uh, it's only in recent years that I find that was uh, hard on children, but I, I didn't see it that way. I, oh, I come home, Dad come home from work that night, we're going to move to Richmond, Virginia. Oh, boy, I always wanted to go to Richmond, you know, and uh, well, I graduated at uh, Garden Hills Grammar School, seventh grade, and was president of the class, started North Fulton High School, and in January moved to Long Island, New York. They put me in the ninth grade there, and uh, they, they had to kind of, they weren't sure what grade to put me in because Georgia had seven and four, whereas New York had uh, six, three, and three. Well, they decided to give me a shot at ninth grade, and I was telling my daughter and son-in-law a while ago that I got there January 1st, and their mid-year exams were January 25th, and they said, we'll put you in the ninth grade, but if you can't make it, don't feel bad. We'll put you in the eighth grade. Well, I aced the, and I brought my report card along to show you if you didn't believe me, and I got <laughs> all A's, <laughs> and, uh, except one B, which was the first B I'd ever made since first grade. and uh, But anyway, I went on to school up there and graduated that June, and they elected me president of that class. I think it's because I was Southerner, and they, they were so amazed to see a Southerner, and I wore shoes and socks and everything. <laughs> and uh, then I went on to the senior high school, and then uh, you want me to keep going till oh, I get? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Uh, and then I graduated from high school there, and 
president of that class. That was three in a row because they liked, the girls liked my curly hair and the boys liked me because I was a little short fella and they thought they could whip up on me. <laughs> so all in all, I got by. <laughs> and uh, then uh, two days after I graduated high school, June of 45, I went down to the University of Virginia and enrolled. And by the next February, I had finished my freshman year. And, uh, and uh, three or four days later, February 12th, I turned 18, enlisted in the Army, and uh, a few days later, reported to Camp Lewis, New Jersey, and uh, stayed there a few weeks. And then they transferred me to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, from there down to uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama. But while I was at Fort Dix, they lost my records. And uh, twice I would get on a troop train loaded to go to somewhere in the, in the U.S. And they'd come calling off my name, get off the train, because they couldn't find my personnel records to go with me. So, uh, in fact, my dad got a phone call saying, where is your son? I don't know how they had his number if they didn't know where my records were. But anyway, he said he's right there in Fort Dix. Okay. So they made me do all the records over again and uh, shots and everything. I said, I've already had those shots. And then the IQ, oh, and I made the highest IQ. One day and after that, a couple of days, a sergeant came out into the barracks calling out my name. Come out here. The commanding general wants to meet you. I said, wow, well, you just made the highest score he's ever, they've processed over a million guys here and never had a score like that. And I said, well, I just took it three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Oh, okay, go on back in the barracks. And that was the end of that. That was my moment of glory. And uh, so anyway, went on down to, uh, let's see, they lost my records. Oh, the, well, I left out when I first got to Camp Lewis couple of days there and roll call that morning. After I called your name, the sergeant said, fall out over there. So there's about 200 of us and I'm left standing there all by myself. What's your name, soldier? I said, Harry D. Allen, Jr. I called your name the first name I called out, Harold D. Allen. That's not my name. Harold, Harold, here, I don't care. You, I called, get over there. For some reason, I pulled KP for the next three days. I, it was, I, I figured out, out later what happened that you don't fuss with the sergeant in the Army. If he says your name's Harold, it's Harold. And I think that's probably why they lost my records. They probably still had them as Harold. And, but Harry is on my birth certificate, I promise you. And uh, so anyway, went on to Fort McClellan, went through infantry basic there. Then at the end of that, two or three months down there. In the heat of the summer, they asked for volunteers. Anybody want to go over to Fort Benning and join the paratroopers? Pay you $50 a month extra. Oh, yeah, I was ready for that. So they took about, took about 20, 25 of us and put us through all kind of exercise and picked about 15 of us, loaded us on a bus, and I went through the eight weeks of paratrooper training, not knowing that I was terribly afraid of heights. Well, I. I knew when they made us go up top of that 40-foot tower and jump off in just a harness and you fall, and just before you hit the ground, it stops you. And I was terrified of that, just climbing up there. And then they took us up to that 250-foot tower with an open parachute and then drop you free fall and let you float down. And I did that, did about three or four of those, terrified. You know, all right, the last day is graduation day. We're all going up and jump out of the airplane. I said, I no way, but I tried to make my willpower overcome my cowardice uh, or my fear, really. I've learned that it wasn't cowardice. In fact, looking back on I'm 90 now, and I've had time to kind of think about things. In a way, I was braver than any of those guys because they were all doing it for fun. They were laughing. They thought it was more fun to go up and jump out of an airplane or jump off that tower. Can I do it again? I didn't want to go anywhere near it. So I was going against a, a, a fear. So anyway, I got up in the airplane 
and we got up there and he's zooming ready to jump. Everybody click, hook up. I said, Sergeant, I'm not going to jump out of this plane. So, okay, he jumped everybody. Then he came back and he said, if you like, come over, stand in the door and I'll throw you out. I said, it, <laughs> it'd take you and about 10 more like you to throw me out. So sit down. We went on back and that was the end of that. And they put me on a troop train, troop train to go to California, Camp Stoneman, and got in a ship to General Weagle there a couple of weeks later. And uh, all I knew is we were heading out in the Pacific and uh, stopped off at Honolulu for about three days. I spent all three of those days ashore riding the buses and walking, walked up and down Waikiki Beach and out to that that uh, volcano. Uh, I forget the name of that mountain. Anyway, I, I enjoyed that. Mauna Kea? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, got to... We encountered a hurricane just as we were around in the southern part of Japan, middle of the night, all the bunks, we were five, four or five deep, creaking, we were guys falling out of them and everything. We were in the middle of a hurricane, uh, they call them... Uh, typhoons out there. Yeah, typhoon. And uh, they, nobody go out. Well, I'm just 18 years old. I had to, I climbed up on, the, we were below the water level, I climbed up there, got out on the deck in the middle of the night. They had their floodlights on though. It's a great big ship, looked like the Queen Mary to me. And you could see these waves higher than a telephone pole, big mountains, and then that ship would go down and the propeller would come out and thud, thud, thud. And then uh, climb back up, taking a big ship with, I don't know, three or 4,000 of us on it. And I sat out there for about a half hour with my feet over the rail, hanging on to the, the railing, da, 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 trying to get my feet in the water. And we'd be way up in the air and then all the way down. I never got wet, though. So I went on back down. That was the end of that. Then we landed at Inchon. Had to go ashore and landing craft because a, a ship like that couldn't, they didn't have a dock or anything in those days. That, that was... Uh, Let's see, I went in in February 20th. This was now November. This was, after, it took us 20 days to cross the Pacific. So it was December 1st, approximately, that we were landing at Inchon. And there was, I don't know, three or four inches of snow on the ground. And he wouldn't let the ramp down. We had to go on, because he didn't want to get stuck. The tide was out. It was just black mud, not a beach. And he didn't want to let his ramp down. And we had to, climb up and jump down and so another buddy and I did this locked arm and boosted the other 20 or 30 guys up one by one and darn it I'm a lot smarter now but I'm the last one and I boosted him up and I said here I am <laughs> well I'm probably the shortest guy on the boat but I managed to clamber up and jump down threw my knapsack over and it landed in the water and uh plopped down in the mud, and I, it was about that far out, and the guy with the landing craft, well, never mind, I'll get it, I'll get it. So they they have two engines, and he put one in reverse and then spun that craft around and then gunned it, made a wave up to about my knees, washed my knapsack way up, knocked me down, and I told him to come back. <laughs> <laughs> come back here, and he waved, laughing, and off he goes. And anyway, we went on into into uh, into uh, uh, Yongdung Po, which is now part of Seoul, but at that time was maybe five miles outside of Seoul, across the Han River. And that's where we stayed for the first uh, month, or maybe it was two months. And one night, in the middle of the night. The barracks building caught on fire. It was a Japanese army barracks building caught on fire in the middle of the night. My two roommates were off on guard duty or whatever. And I gathered all their junk together and threw it out the window. And my junk threw it out the window. And went, and went, I went down the steps and then went around and got all our stuff up out of the snow. And we moved out of that to another camp about, I'd say about four or five miles away. And... Uh, stayed there the rest of the time I was there. I stayed, that was in uh, 
we got there in December 1st. Oh, on that ship was a load of mail, uh, uh, 18-wheeler load full, stacked, piled up mail sacks. And they, after they, that first morning, everybody called out three names, my name and two other guys, Joe Harkins, one, I don't know the other. And he said, stay here. You guys are going to sort that mail out. And it's, I said, why did you pick me? He said, well, while you guys have been sleeping, I've been going through the personnel folder, and all three of you have got a year of college, so you're going to sort the mail out. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, and it better be done by Christmas, because this is all Christmas stuff. Well, I think it was about April by the time we finished, <laughs> as I remember. <laughs> it was well into the spring, anyway. <laughs> and uh, during that spring, this is when I tell my family the famous story when I got captured. I was great for on the weekend or any time I had a day off, go hiking around. I went, I've got a thing full of pictures I took in Seoul and around there. And I'd love to go in and walk around Seoul and around the villages and all that. It was, see, the Cor South Koreans were not our enemies. They, we, were, we had driven the Japanese out, so we were their friends. But the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans were at odds. How was that peninsula going to be divided? And they had finally come to an agreement with a 38th parallel, but that's all for the moment. And we knew all the time. We were always having little episodes firing across the line. More than once I had to sleep with my rifle because we were on duty, I mean uh, on alert. It had to stay fully dressed. You just your boots sitting there and your rifle with you in case you had they call it alarm, but it never happened. Well, I mean it happened a couple of times, but there was false alarms. So anyway, this one day, one weekend, my buddy and me, I said, I've heard there's tigers up in those mountains, those hills over there. Let's go look it. So we strapped on our M ones over our shoulder and away we went. And we're walking along a path through the kind of woods several miles from the base. And all of a sudden, these four, five, six Oriental soldiers, they were about my, my size. And they had a, <coughs> kind of, not OD, wasn't yellow, wasn't olive drab. I don't know, kind of like your, your shirt. And it was kind of a, and they had rifles longer than they were, big. And I'm pointing to my, no, U.S., America, you know. Don't shoot a whiff. Well, that didn't matter. Put your hand, you know, and they prodded us to go. Oh, okay. And they stayed about 15, 20 feet behind us and marched us along. We marched, I don't know, half an hour and uh, came to a little clutch of, I call them huts. They're grass covered. The things the Koreans lived in, mud huts kind of. There were five or six of them. And I told my buddy, I don't like this. I don't know where they're taking us and what what's going on here, but they they don't act very friendly. So I'm getting out of here. So as soon as we got to that very first hut, I made a hard left turn, and away we went through the bushes. It was a rather thick uh, undergrowth. We went flying fast as we could run. They came running after us, but they didn't shoot. And after, I'll say 50, 100 yards maybe, they, didn't, they weren't back there anymore, and we kept on running <sighs> about a mile, I guess, and we finally stopped. And after that, found our way on back to our base gradually. I, I remember seeing the dikes along the edge of the Han River, and I knew that led to Seoul. So we followed that dike and got back to our base. And to this day, I don't know who they were or what the... I'm theorizing that they were coming south of the 38th on a look-see expedition to find out. Kempel Air, Air Base was there, near there, and maybe they were just spying, I don't know. And they were told, don't cause any trouble. That's why they didn't shoot, I think. Did they capture your weapons? No, they never did. We had them slung over our back, and they never did take our rifles. And it wasn't anyway, I kept trying to figure how fast I could get that rifle around and get it turned around. Yeah. And I knew by then I'd be dead. 
but and that's bothered me all this time. But they marched us at rifle point, and uh, we didn't want to go that way. We wanted to go back where we came from. So I, the only thing I can think of is they were on some kind of look see, and they were told that don't create any disturbance. And this, by luck, they ran across ran across us, and said, "We'll just take them back with us. Look what we got, you know." But I'll never know. Anyway, then uh, we got back to the base, and you know, in a couple hours, and we decided we better not tell the sergeant because we weren't supposed. To, he, what he did to us might be worse than what they were going to do. So you learn in the army, don't tell the sergeant any more than you have to, you know. So. That, that was fine, and then in uh, Ju June the 29th, I got loaded back on that same ship, the General Weagle, and back to the U.S., San Francisco, Camp Stoneman, and then from there I took a bus down to Los Angeles where my real mother lived and uh, stayed with two weeks with her, went sightseeing all around Hollywood and all that, and every time I see that Hollywood sign, I remember standing there looking at that. And uh, then back to Long Island, got back there in uh, July sometime, and then back to the University of Virginia to resume my second year. And then I graduated uh, in 49, two years later. That was 47. Did you have to reapply or had they held you as basically a... Uh, I'll say that again. Did the university hold your place um, they must have because I graduated with my class, even though I'd been gone a year and a half. I took wow. extra courses all the time and uh, went to summer school, 48. To, so between the summer school and the extra courses, I finished with my same class. But they were, the colleges were on a year-round basis during World War II to help students hurry and get out of college so we can get you in the Army. And so... Anyway, I graduated in 49. Doug, Doug, excuse me for interrupting. When, when did you try to, to touch the Golden Gate Bridge? When was that? When did I do what? The Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, yeah, coming back from Korea in uh, uh, July of uh, 47. It's nighttime, dark. It was about 9 o'clock, and we could see the Golden Gate Bridge over there. It looked like a string of pearls. And I thought, God, we'll never fit under there. Although we had already fit under there coming out, but you don't think logically. I said, there's no way. So as we approached it in the darkness, I climbed up the mast, and there's a cross piece up, really just a radio tower. And then I, two or three other guys came up, and we were sitting up there like birds. And about that time, the sergeant said, all right, call us down there. You know you're not supposed to climb up there. And he lined them up, and I'm over next to the funnel. And he was taking names of the fifth guy down here. And it's dark, pitch dark. I took off around that funnel <laughs> quietly and went down the stairs to my bunk and laid there like I'd been asleep all day. And then the next day we unloaded the ship going down the gangplank and I just knew. He's there with his clipboard checking the names off as you come down. I knew he was going to say, all right, off to one side. <laughs> but I, I had my duffel bag and I'm kind of, he didn't, I got by and nothing ever happened. So I got away with him. Running away. That's twice I've run away. You obviously found the secret of getting by in the military. I have right? learned how to run. Need attention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Back to the university, and uh, nothing happened there really. Just working all the time, going to school. Got married. Graduated in June. Got married in um, August. And. Uh, was, I had enrolled in graduate school back in uh, June, went to summer school and graduate school. And, and in October, my wife was a nurse at University Hospital, and our apartment was about a mile across, completely across the grounds. And I'd walk her over, and she was on the 11 to 7 shift, and I'd walk over at night, and in the morning she'd walk back. And we did that 
We did that in the October, middle of October. I didn't like that at all. And I had bought a little 1931 Chevrolet for $50 that would own, didn't have a starter. You'd have to get it on a roll and pop the clutch if you young people don't know what that is. But oh, yeah. <laughs> Roger will know what that is. Yeah. And uh, I'd always roll it down and pop the clutch and away we'd go. Anyway, I got tired of that life. Out of, and I got my first job in a bank in Richmond as a note teller, uh, what they call a loan teller. And uh, uh, the officers would approve these loans and then they'd bring it over to my window and I'd dole out the money, whatever it called for. Or the used car dealers would bring their paper to finance cars. One of them was Dapper Dan, the used car man. And he'd bring his papers in there every day or two and lay them there and we'd set up the account and I'd dole out his money. And I did that for about a year and I found a fellow that I replaced was 43 years old, Pete Hayes. And one day he let me know what his salary was. And he had been there 22 years. And, I, and he's only making $325 a month. Of course, I was only making 200. So that was the going wage then. When he hired me, that October, the, uh, the bank president hired me, Mr. French, and he said, well, I'll offer you 185, and I kind of did like that, I guess, because he, well, okay, I'll make it 200, but that's more than we've been paying. But see, that 200, you all would laugh at that. <laughs> but anyway, when Pete told me he was making three and a quarter, and he had been there 22 years. So I left the bank and got a job back in Charlottesville with a finance company and as assistant manager. And I stayed there five years till I became manager of it. Then another finance company was opening up in the state of Virginia. And a buddy of mine had taken a job to open an office for him down in Martinsville, Virginia. And he said they want to open one in Roanoke. So I called him up and they took me down there and interviewed me and all and hired me. So I opened the office in Roanoke and they bought me a brand new 1955 Chevrolet right off the dealer's yard. That was the first V8 engine Chevrolet I had. Everybody wanted to look at it. That was so I could make calls. And it turns out, see I wasn't smart enough to figure all this out ahead of time. I was supposed to go out and call on all out in the lower sections of town, used car dealers, furniture, used furniture, anything that people buy that want to finance through the finance company. And then they'd bring all that loan paper, they'd bring them to me. Uh, I didn't like working that side of the street. I was used to the higher end of the business, you might say, the credit business. And uh, so I left that job in, uh, November, November, Becky, Becky was starting kindergarten at that time. What year are we up to now? That would have been 1955, fall of 55, yeah. Okay. Yeah, November 55. So I moved back to Long Island, New York. My dad was having medical problems and uh, my stepmother was worried about that and I thought I can help dad. Actually, he was an alcoholic. and wonderful man, but alcohol got the best of him. And I thought maybe I could help him. That didn't work out. It's like smoking or alcohol. Nobody else can do it. You have to do it yourself. And so anyway, I got a job up there with uh, uh, American Express in Manhattan. Rode a train in every day about 30 miles all the way into New York subway down to American Express, back up. Took me two hours each way each day, four hours traveling. I did that for a, a year, no, not a year, until the following July or August, I guess, yeah. Becky. Yeah, and a buddy of mine here in Atlanta, Henry Jackson, who lived on Lakeview Avenue also near me, had been after me for three or four years to come down there and he was, making a lot of money building subdivisions, houses. 
and he needs somebody to do the office work. He was good at promoting and all that, but he didn't care about all that paperwork, and he thought I'd be a good guy. He had, he kept begging me to come down. Well, finally, he sent me a plane ticket up one week, and that weekend I flew to Atlanta, and he got in the car and drove me all around where he's building out in Sandy Springs, and uh, made me a real nice offer. Offered to pay all of the moving van and everything. So I went home, told my wife, we're gonna go back to Atlanta, where I'm from anyway. So we moved back to Atlanta in 56. My daughter had been born in June of that year, and also my wife's mother had moved in with us. She had retired as a school teacher at age 65 up in Virginia. So I now had uh, four children and a mother-in-law <laughs> and a wonderful lady and I lived with us for the next 18 years. I think it's 18 years. And we moved back to Atlanta and I went to work for Rich's department store after I, oh, I went to work with my buddy and yeah, he was, he was building subdivisions everywhere. Make, and I got, after I did what he wanted me to do, get all his paperwork straightened out. I went in and I said, Henry, you owe more money then if you sell all these houses that you're worth, you can't even pay off. Oh, don't worry, that's what a construction loan's for. You get a, you build another subdivision, get an advance on that, and that's what you use to pay those. I said, I see how that works short run, but sooner or later it catches up. Sure enough, about 18 months later, December, they had a interest rate hike and all the housing sales went down. We had an inventory of like a dozen unsold houses. And he, he said, okay, and so he bankrupted the company. Right and I went, Christmas. huh? Right before Christmas. Yes, oh yeah, it was uh, Christmas okay. week. It was oh, like wow. 21st. So home, no I came home that night, told my wife, I not only don't have a job, I don't even have this week's pay, he paid every Friday. I don't even have this week's paycheck. Oh well. But within, it took me about three days to find a job at Rich's department store. You all, you, you'll remember, you'll remember. Yeah. And uh, in the collect, to be head of the collection department because of my background. And I stayed there till uh, 75. That was from 58 to 75. Yeah. And uh, then I left there. Mr. Rich had retired. I would on good terms with him and his secretary. She was all called me every day to come down there to some mad customer, they charge account, some take care of it. And they knew I could calm the customer down because Mr. Rich didn't want to have to bother with all that. So, but he retired. And uh, Mr. Brocky became president, and he was a good guy, and I liked him, got along fine. But then he had Joel Goldberg, his son-in-law, to become president. And he was a quiet fellow. He didn't visit the credit department or have, I mean, I'd have to go down there and see him a couple of times a week when he'd have mad customers. But anyway, I just decided this is, uh, this is no longer the place. Oh, I left out. They got a, the controller retired also, re resigned. He didn't like it either. John Bradley, good fellow, my boss. And uh, he moved to Louisiana. And then they, the new controller was a real pain to everybody, including me. He'd pick up, I'd get a, Doug, I need you right away. Bang. Come in his office. None of this, are you busy? Or, Anything. A couple of times I said, I'm sorry, I'm with a customer right now. I don't care. Come here. That's the way he talked. Uh, you can imagine anybody that knows my personality. I had put up with that too long. In fact, I had words with him. When you call me and tell me to come, I went up there and I said, now look, when you call and tell me to come here, I'm glad to do it. But my our customers come first. And the sooner you learn that, the better off you're going to be because they're the ones that pay the bills. He didn't like that a bit. <laughs> and nobody ever talked to him straight that way. So anyway, I left Richard and went to work with Equifax. 
and stayed with them till I retired at age 60. I stayed with them 77, 12, 12 years. That's what my, my retirement thing says, 12 years. And they made me a regional, they hired me as an assistant vice president and raised about a, eight months later, raised me to Southeast Regional VP, Southeast Region, all these seven, eight states here. And uh, all the credit bureaus, we had about a dozen in each state, plus we had affiliated credit bureaus. So it'd be about 20 credit bureaus scattered around it. Like here in Georgia, it's Atlanta and Gainesville and Rome and Carrollton and, you know, Cedartown and all over. Anyway, that's what I did, and I really enjoyed that. That was a wonderful company, a lot of good people there. I retired at age 60. My wife became ill with uh, emphysema and uh, uh, couldn't work anymore. She was a, a nurse at uh, Northside Hospital. And uh, about eight months, let's see, yeah. I retired about, she fell out on the job in the middle of the night from emphysema. And the doctor, when I got there, the doctor said, well, I've been, that morning, he said, I've been telling her for three or four years that she's getting emphysema. But my wife never told me that. She, I didn't even know what emphysema was, to tell you the truth. When I would come home from work and she had been to the doctor, I'd say, well, what did the doctor have to say today? Well, he told me to quit smoking and he told me that I had a, he gave me something for, for, for my cold. But she, mommy, Becky, mom never really told me. I would have put the law down about the, I tried to help her. That's how I know about alcohol. My dad with alcohol and my wife with cigarette. Bless her heart, sweetest lady in the world. She was smoking when I met her at the University of Virginia. She was in nursing school, or she had just graduated, and she was smoking in. But everybody smoked then. I didn't think anything of it. In fact, I tried to. I bought some cigarettes and tried to pick it up. After a couple of months, I said, I just can't catch this habit, which proves you need to think you're getting away with something, doing something you're not supposed to do, and then you can do it. <laughs> Well, I was trying to, but anyway, she, bless her heart, the doctor said she's not going to live very long, two or three years. I'm sorry to tell you that, but I've told her that. You know, she hasn't told me that. So I took early retirement at Equifax. He said, somebody's going to have to take care of her. I put her in a nursing home. Which she fooled him, bless her heart. Mom lived 13 years. And, and died in December of, of uh, 2001 and uh, Christmas week. But uh, she was she was strong. She did give up smoking, although she tried to start it again a couple of times. <laughs> and I would smell it. I'd, <laughs> you know, she thought if she went to the bathroom and closed both doors, nobody would know. <laughs> so she opened, <gasps> <laughs> and bless her heart, I have two children who smoke. Becky's one of six. Becky doesn't smoke, and the other, uh, two, two of them do. And they saw their mother, and they, one of them lives with me. Doug is 65 and a bachelor, and he smokes like, just smokes every day, all day. Not all day, that's an exaggeration, but, you know, a lot. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, Nancy smokes. She's 57. But uh, they know they know what happened, and they Nancy has tried everything hypnosis and wearing patches and anything you can think of. Nothing she can't quit. She's tried and tried and tried, and I don't fuss because it doesn't do any good. My sister Barbara is 86 years old and has emphysema and is on her deathbed now in hospice. And for the last two years, the doctor keeps saying she's not going to live much longer. But she keeps living, and bless her heart. And uh, I can't hardly understand when she talks, because she doesn't have any breath. But she, and she has quit smoking three months ago. Bless her, finally, finally. 
took all these years, but it's of course too late now. Now her daughter and her sister, they're my, my half sister, her daughter uh, and her daughter both fuss at her about smoking. And I've pleaded with them, don't fuss at her. She's in a hospice situation. Whether she quits or doesn't quit, it's not gonna make any difference now. Leave her alone, let her, try to let her be happy. Uh, it wouldn't bother me if she started smoking again. In fact, two years ago, three years ago, I guess it was, I bought a, a pack of cigarettes on the way home from the hospital. She won't meet us, she's in and out of the hospital. I'm out of cigarettes and I pull in her drugstore and buy the cigarettes, which is crazy, I know. But the more I think about it, I'm perfectly proud that I have did what I could to make her happy. There's no way I could refuse to buy the cigarettes. She'd just get somebody else to buy them. You know, no need of having an argument with somebody that's at the end of their life. So let's see, I've got you all the way up to my retirement. And since then, I've just lived alone. After my wife died, I live alone. Becky lives across the street. They called me one day. We were living in a condominium that we had bought that had steps and my wife couldn't do the steps. We didn't think about that. <clears throat> Becky called one day and said, the lady across the streets put a for sale sign up. I said, does Rick, your husband know that? <laughs> she said, yeah, he knows it. Okay, we, and it was more or less what we were looking for. It has stairs and the garage is under the house, but I had electric stair lift put in and uh, so she could use that. And I had a battery scooter for her to use around the house and a wheelchair downstairs. And we, I'd take her to the grocery store and take her in a wheelchair. And uh, that was our life. And uh, since 01, I don't have anything exciting to talk about since, since she died. That was the end of my excited, excited life. Well, a pretty full one, I must say. Uh, could I take you back to 1950 and ask you, you were then a honorably discharged veteran uh, yes. in graduate school, I guess. And yeah. Were you still in school in 1950 or were you out? Let's see, I graduated in June 49, Okay. went to grad school and in that fall, I uh, got, I left graduate school and got a job. I never got my master's. I dropped out in October. Well, in October of 1950. Uh, of, of 1949. Well, I'm, I'm Oh, excuse forward. me. <laughs> in October of 1950, that was the invasion of Inchon. Yes. Where you had been. Uh, so that, that must have uh, brought back a few memories. I went to Inchon in, uh, let's see, uh, I was 18. They, 46, yeah. December 46, yeah. yeah, December 46. But your description of some of the problems with that harbor uh, must have yes. been I've often, important. You it's knew funny. what the problems were in that invasion. It's, it's funny that you, not funny, but it's interesting that you, I've, when they in, landed at Inchon, I often wondered how in the world did they land thousands of troops there with those mud flats. Yeah, I've heard it said that if you've made a list of all the things you didn't want for an invasion, Inchon had them all. Uh, Inchon had what? Inchon had all the things that you wouldn't want. For oh, an yes. They very exactly. high yes. tides. Yeah, up a bank, mud flats. Yep. Yeah, it's a terrible place to go ashore. <laughs> uh, sandy beach is fun, you know. And there was not one single casualty in the U.S. forces in that invasion. How about that? that I, was, did, I wasn't that aware was, of that. Yeah, that was just absolutely yeah. incredible. Uh-huh. It was a 25, about 25 mile ride from Incheon to Seoul or to Yongpeng Po. And it was a little narrow gauge railroad, <laughs> little tiny cars, nothing like our railroads. But I guess they put us on those those train cars and took us to Mm -hmm. to Yongdung Po. Oh, and I, it was, before I forget to show you there in Yongdung Po, which was a kind of a little town, had a big smokestack and it's still there, I think, from the pictures I've seen. Uh, the Korean, we were, we were not to uh, 
eat any of their food, but we could fraternize with them. And, and there was a Korean woman there that would do our wash our clothes for us. So I, the only thing I've got is this, sh is this shirt. And I noticed that she has had something in Korean sewed on it so she could tell it belonged to me. You don't read Korean, do you? <laughs> I got to take it to Korea. It probably says tall, good looking fella. <laughs> And uh, but anyway, that's the way we got our laundry done. And I brought you these. I made these just. These are things I got all off of where we were at Incheon, and uh, where I think we were captured. I don't really. You can you can okay. keep those okay, if you. Great, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Allen, I've got a question for you. Yes, ma'am. You had completed one year of college before you went in the mil. Yeah. Why? Why did you go into the military, and why the army? That's a good question. And I, I was a pretty smart little fellow. Money meant everything to me. I was. I didn't. My parents didn't help me. And uh, I had a little scholarship down there, and I knew they had the GI Bill then, and I knew, and you got a year just for going in. And then month for month, well, 18 and 12 is 30. You with me? <laughs> yes. And I had 27 months to go, three times nine, plus a summer school two months made, you know. And I had all that figured out. So as soon as I had my 18th birthday, I enlisted immediately, like two days later. How did your dad and your stepmom feel about that? They didn't care yeah, okay. one way or the other. My dad was a fine fellow, but he was too busy. He never, he, neither one of them, the only school I ever remember them coming to was in the fifth grade. My stepmother came to E Rivers when I was in the fifth grade. We were having a field day of some kind. She came to that. And then when I graduated at seventh grade, at Garden Hills Grammar School, my mother and my my stepmother and my dad came to that, and that's the only two times in my ten years or however many twelve eleven years of school that my parents ever came to the school. Wow. And now I hear Becky's all practically lives. At her. She's got twenty two grandchildren, and she lives at their schools, and she doesn't know it. But I think, oh. Would you come to my school? <laughs> <laughs> what about your school patrol trip? You know that the. Uh, oh yeah, when I was in the uh, seventh grade, going to graduate grammar school at Garden Hills Grammar School. That uh, spring, along about April, um, uh, February rather, uh, the teacher said uh, uh, the, they had the, what they called a schoolboy patrol. I don't know if the schools still have it, and you wear a little white belt and I was captain of the school boy in my school my you know every shift I'm out there you go stand over and you go over there. all right one day the teachers every year they had a uh, a meeting in Washington DC and the school boy patrols came from all over we had a train full leave Atlanta full of school boy patrols from all over Georgia well, anyway and it was going to cost 34 dollars so I went home that afternoon and told my stepmother about it. She said, we, we can't afford that. That's, no, we, I'm sorry. So the next day I told the teacher, I, I, I can't go. Okay, that's the end of that. About two weeks later when I came home one afternoon, my stepmother said, the lady that's uh, president of the PTA called and they're gonna pay for your trip to Washington. And I thought, well, that's nice how, of course, I didn't. I've thought a lot of things I should have said. You all spent enough on whiskey on the weekend to pay for my trip. You ought to be ashamed making them. But I've thought of a lot of mean things to say in my older years. But my older sister, Gala, who's eight, 19 months older than me, has, I think, convinced me to be more charitable. And that uh, don't, don't think those mean thoughts because they hurt you more than they do that person anyway. Uh, and I've gradually, at age 90, finally, I think I see the wisdom of that. Because I realize now my stepmother 
the, 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 the getting a divorce when I'm 10 months old and then marrying her and her and I didn't get along to her. But I wasn't there and I don't know all the circumstances. I don't know. So it's better that I not be judgmental. So I, I try. I'm probably more broad-minded about the failings of my generation, people around me now. I say, oh, don't take it that way. You know, I wish I'd been that wise when I was younger. But, but as he gets the old German saying, or Dutch, if he gets too soon old and too late smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Heard that one. Uh, looking back on your time in the service, since this yes. uh, Veterans History Project is about the service, uh, what comments might you have about, you know, what did you feel about what you were doing at the time? How did you get along oh. uh, with the people that you served with? Well, I, 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 the service in the Army was not bad. I, didn't, I can't say I enjoyed it, but uh, I made a lot of good friends, and uh, they made me the postal clerk there. I was our postal clerk, and I wrote the money orders because any of the guys want to send money back home, I had them in a lockbox, and they had to go in the command, uh, captain's desk drawer every night. And then if during the day anybody wanted money, a regular U.S. postal money, I had to rubber stamp and everything, and $20, you know, and make it, a, and they could mail those off. So I had that little job to do. And that's about the only pull of guard duty occasionally and things like that. But it was just pretty humdrum. I didn't do anything exciting. I rode the truck out to Inchon a few times the 18-wheeler we had to load up with mail sacks if it was an incoming ship, and we'd have it piled up, and then we'd, a couple of us would ride up on top of it with rifles, because the Koreans would grab the bags as you went through a village or something. And we'd, oh, we'd be up there doing like this, don't you dare, don't even think about it. <laughs> and then we also rode that truck out to Kempo Airfield full of mail sacks, because, I, oh, I left out. I was assigned to the a, to the post office for Korea. That was the central post office for all the Army bases. We sorted out the mail to go out to all the various places. So, and, and same way with the incoming mail going back to the States, we had to bag it all up and then load it on the truck and take it to Kempo. I've got a picture in there of loading the C-54s full of mail sacks, driving, fly back to the United States. And it's pretty humdrum, I guess, but I was 18, 19. I, I thought I was having fun. <laughs> I, I want to ask you about a story you once told about some incoming milk or something. <coughs> some what, Rick? Milk, some sort of story about milk coming in. Oh, yeah, there in, uh, in Korea. One day they told us, uh, we're going to have milk. We've got a shipment of milk in. So the mess hall was over here in a Quonset hut. Oh, boy. And we all get your cup out, your canteen cup. And we lined up. Everybody had their cup. Fill it. And he was there filling it. It was turned out reconstituted. It was powdered milk. <laughs> Man, as soon as I got, got a, drank that whole thing. Sick as a dog. <laughs> didn't didn't keep it more than an hour, maybe. <laughs> but that was a big occasion to get some milk. Yeah. And when I first went in at uh, Camp Lewis, New Jersey, there were German prisoners of war there still. Uh, I guess they were being processed to send them back to Europe. Because this was, would have been February of 1946, and the war had just ended in August, six months sooner. And uh, they, were, they did all the KP. We, we ate there, us guys. We were new recruits, just been there two or three, four days, whatever. And our, our, these were all German soldiers and big tall blonde fellows and we're a bunch of little scrawny fellows from Brooklyn and Harlem and Manhattan and out on Long Island and we probably look pretty scrawny to them and I remember 
couple of them teasing, making some teasing remarks about that. I didn't think that, and they had their their ground, their, where they lived right next to it, beautiful flower gardens, it looked prettier than my yard. <clears throat> but anyway, I didn't like those guys talking that way. And talking, I, I left out, I never had been bullied in school because I was a short fellow, but I was very muscular and very strong, and and uh, so nobody ever messed with me. And those fellows, I challenged a couple of them, to, or, and I beat two or three of them. They were both <laughs> twice as big as me. And that kind of taught them a lesson, you know. We may be short and scrawny, but we whipped you guys, didn't we? <laughs> so that was a high point of my early induction into the Army. <laughs> Well, speaking of the aftermath of World War II, when you got to Korea, uh, were there still any Japanese troops there? Uh, no. Uh, as I mentioned, we were in their barracks, but they had all been shipped back to Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Korean people were, we were not too, f we were friendly with them, but we were told not to eat, go, you know, get too intimate with them. And uh, I have dozens of pictures of me taking pictures of them. They were always very friendly to us. And yet kind of stand, I guess they didn't know quite what to think of us. Americans, Japanese, either way, it's an outside occupation. And Japan had ruled that country since 1903, I believe. They hated the Japanese. Boy. Uh, my understanding is that but they, the, uh, when I there were Japanese kept in North Korea. Uh, they hung on to some of the Japanese that had surrendered on that side. I don't know. Yeah, the Russians did. Yeah, I remember there was a big high-powered meeting in Seoul <clears throat> that spring. The Russians and Chinese and North Koreans, because several of us had to be on duty down there, and they had the U.S. flag and Russian. I got a picture of that. And, uh, meeting down in the city hall of some big building there in Seoul. And they were having some kind of argument about the 38th parallel north and south. Yeah. Still still arguing about, see the north, the Chinese and Russians wanted all of that to be communist. Yep. And we wanted the south to, we didn't want it to be communist. That's what the argument was about. And that's what caused the war really. Do uh, you have any thoughts about the upcoming? Hmm? Do you have any thoughts about the upcoming summit with the head of North? Korea? I'm real. I'm I'm real delighted, and I'm optimistic that uh, they will show that capitalism uh, and democracy is better than totalitarian state. When he sees what, when he sees what's how prosperous South Korea is versus North Korea, you've seen those aerial shots at night of the lights. Yeah. And this is all lit up, and this is dark, one or two little lights. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the fellow won't let his ego get in the way of mm -hmm. doing something. I'm really hopeful. And I they see they're going to meet in Singapore, and I think that's real good progress. I would have been happy for him to meet there at the, on the 38th. And they yeah. thought about it. I, yeah. But I thought that would have been a... He could have stepped across. Pompeo's been there. Yeah. You know, he's been all the way to Panmunjom. Um, let me see. I wrote my notes to see if there was anything. Rick made me do it. Make sure I didn't leave out anything. <laughs> I told you about the hurricane. I told you about the paratrooper flunking out to go to that. Say, did you ever get your $50? Oh yeah, I got it. Oh wait, wait, no. We had to graduate first to get it. Ah, uh, dirty trick. Okay. <laughs> I went through all that two months of rough try. I just finished infantry, and then that, they t at least I learned how to kill people with my bare hands, so be careful. <laughs> no, they did, they taught us how to, if a guy comes at you with a, a knife or something, what, how to do it, and how to, taught us all those tricky things. I never have had a chance to use it. Yeah, I told you about that. Yeah, riches. 
<laughs> I did think about it a couple of times. <laughs> that uh, that new controller that came in. I did think about that. Yeah. Oh, I did leave out that one time I was hiking. I see this. I was hike on my own, hiking up a hill outside of Yongdong Po, a few miles away, and I noticed four, three or four Korean men were following me, maybe a couple of hundred yards back. And I thought, why wow, they followed me? And I walk on, I look around, and they still follow. Excuse me. I hope that didn't come over the mic. So I got my, I had my rifle. I took it on. I fired two or three shots near them, not yeah. just to kick up some dirt. Last time I saw, they were about a half mile away running fast. <laughs> I, I hate it. Looking back on it, I hate it. They probably just want to be friends, but I didn't know. Yeah. I told you about, yeah, yeah, I, I feel like I've told you everything I know and then some. I yeah. have a question. You seem to be, to have a very open, uh, jovial and adventuresome person. Thank you. Which I can appreciate. I Thank try you. to emulate that. Not, not very well sometimes. How about your children? Did, did uh, Becky and did Becky, some of the other children, yeah. are they like you? Uh, well, I guess Becky could answer that better than me, but she certainly, she's, she's, everybody loves her. And her 22 children, I mean grandchildren, her five children, well, she and Rick both are just, they just unusual people. And then uh, my son Doug is a pretty much of a loner. He's never married, he's a bachelor. He likes girls, and he's dated quite a few of them, but they've all taken advantage of him. He's like Carter Beck. He's like Carter Coleman, really, in many ways. I've thought of uh, somebody on my wife's side. But he's uh, never wanted to get married, and, and he's a nice guy and all that. And he, he and I get along fine, except he smokes, but that's... that's and let's see, Carolyn is a... PhD professor at Walford College uh, for 30 years or whatever, teaching French and Spanish, and she's been all over South America and Europe uh, in connection with school. And let's see, Virginia lives in Woodstock. She works in Northside Hospital. She's divorced now, and, and, uh, but she's, she's doing fine. She's living alone in her own home over there. And let's see, Nancy lives in North Cherokee. She has two two daughters, neither of them married yet. They're in their 20s. I'm still hoping they will. And a real real nice husband. And she's the horse girl. She ha doesn't have a, three horses now, Becky? I think she had nine at one time. So they have seven acres up there. and. Uh, just talk to her, I talk to her practically every day. And then Bill, my son, the youngest one, and he's uh, 59, his huh? His river adventures, for example. Well, his adventures along the rivers, the canoe trips he's taken. I bet him. The adventures Bill has taken. Oh, my goodness, my so, son Bill, who is 59, lives in, with an Ackworth address, but he's closer to Woodstock. All of my family is all within Woodstock or Cherokee, or this side, including her family, except for the one daughter up at Spartanburg, South Carolina, at Walford College, but all the rest of them are here. And now Bill is in the home, re home repair. He's been doing that for, let's see, he's 59. He's been doing it since he was 16, so 43 years. And uh, and I've always been that way, and and he started out helping me with a hammer and a nail, and that's he makes his living, building decks or room additions or finishing off the basement, things like it, remodeling, I guess you'd call it, and does very well, and goes fishing and hunting, and uh, uh, he goes to Lake Oconee, fishing all the time. 
or down near Savannah, hog hunting. He knows where all the things are. And what, Becky, what well, was? There was that. Oh, yeah, the canoe trip. That, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he was documenting places that no one had been before. Yes, the two canoe trips. He one he took last year and one he took just a month or so ago. One is on the uh, Altamaha, oh no, Okmulgee, and it went through a swamp there that nobody, had, and he spent three days in his canoe crossing that swamp. And the fellow down at uh, Louisville, Georgia, uh, they won't say it Louisville, it's Louisville. That's one capital of Georgia at one time. The man that runs the newspaper there had a front page story and pictures about him because nobody had ever been able to go all the way through that swamp and Bill did it. And then months ago he did another trip down the Ohoopi, Ohoopi River Ohoopi. down in South Georgia down around Milledgeville somewhere down that way and it took him a week to do that seven days till it came into the Altamaha and that included some swamp areas and he camp on the on the bank each night go about 15 miles it was pretty close to 100 miles in his canoe but that's his idea of fun and he's got two daughters they're both married and one of them has two children one of them just got married and doesn't have any children yet and lives in Alpharetta so he's turned out very well can build anything, fix anything. If that camera broke right now and fell in a pile on the floor, I believe he'd have it up and running in about half a minute. <laughs> He's just got that talent for fixing things. So yeah, all my, I guess you'd say all my job, I haven't had any. I, I, I'm so blessed to have it. I have 27 great-grandchildren, 13 grands and six children. And none of them, except the two that I know of, smoke or drink, right? Is that as far as you know? I don't think anybody I know, he, they do any of that stuff. So how about your birthday party? Tell oh, my goodness. Oh, up. why didn't I bring a picture? Becky and Rick put on, back in February 12th, they were going to have a big birthday party. They did it a year ago. And about 80 people showed up. This time, 96 people were going to. And uh, they do it in the gymnasium of uh, the church that, that, one, that one of her daughters belongs to here on the Holcomb Bridge Road. Uh, that, I'm pointing to it. It's up there in Roswell. <clears throat> and uh, we postponed it because of the flu epidemic at that time. It'd be a lot of hugging and kissing, hopefully. And uh, we didn't want to spread the flu around. So we postponed it until April 29th, last Saturday, and did it again. 96 people showed up. Um, 80 of them, my, my best estimate without actually doing a body count, I'll say 80 of them were my family, either blood kin or in-laws married. And then the others were like some neighbors and some friends that belonged to sons of Confederate veterans with Rick and me because three of my great-grandfathers fought for the Confederacy. So we belong to Sons of Confederate Veterans to honor them, make sure their story, the true story, is told. And uh, so anyway, we had 96 people at the birthday party, and uh, all of them signed a big chart. I've got hanging in my hallway at home now. <laughs> Pretty, pretty lucky. Doug, they know you're also they did all the food too. You're also a member of the Sons of American Revolution. Yeah. And uh, as I recall, you're also a member of Mensa. When did you do that? Yeah. Oh, that was about 30 years ago. Some of you, some of the kids were kidding me. They were in high school or college, whatever. How smart they were. And I said something about. Well, I was an A student too. So anyway, I decided to take the Mensa test. And I, pa <laughs> I passed it with flying colors. <laughs> now I've got a chart there in my room hanging on the wall. It says, and I got a card in my wallet here. It says, I just act dumb. Does that get you free coffee anywhere? 
Sir? Does that get you free coffee anywhere? <laughs> I drink coffee. Does the Mensa card get you any free coffee? I got it. <laughs> I'm sorry. All I heard was Mensa card. But I got it, though, boy. I got my Social Security card. That's the most important of all. Oh, yeah. I got that card when I was 16 years old up in Long Island. Went and got it the next day, I guess. Uh, Social Security. Doug, I think one of your biggest hobbies is genealogy. You want to mention that? Well, yeah, I did because uh, the background is that I didn't know. I thought my stepmother was my mother, and at 14 I was rummaging in the attic in some boxes up there. My, no, it was after school. Nobody was at home. I didn't have anything to do. I went up there. My dad used to keep old magazines, and here's an envelope marked divorce. Uh, and there's the divorce papers, some, my name, my sister Geta, that's a, Geta, G-E-T-T-A is a French nickname for Agatha, because our grandmother was French. And you say Agatha in French. But anyway, has some lady, Bess Morton Lewis. I never heard of that lady. So my sister came home, she knew about it. They told her, because she was almost five, when they divorced, and I was just uh, uh, 10 months. No, wait, she was five. When they remarried, what she knew. And uh, they told her, but don't tell your, your brother. So she, how the poor little girl kept that secret, but she did. So when I saw those papers, my sister, I heard her downstairs coming home from school. I said, gotta come up here in the attic. She came, I said, look here, what I, <laughs> She took it. Oh, no, no, you don't need to see that. Just, oh, sure, I'm going to forget it. Sure, I am. <laughs> she showed it to my stepmother, and the very next day, my stepmother got me to one side and said, Sorry you found those papers. That woman was a terrible woman. Please don't tell your father that you know about it because he hates her. And she's, that would just break his heart if he thought, he didn't want you to know anything about her. She shouldn't have said it like that, but she did. And she asked if I would still love her, and I assured her of that, and I thanked her for raising me, and I guess said all the right things. And I never did say a word to my dad till he died at 65, uh, 20, well, I was 14, 30 years later, whatever. And, uh, uh, I decided, well, I got to find out about this person. And I thought and thought and thought, and I said, Gatta seems to know a lot about this. So when nobody was home again the next few days, I searched my sister's bedroom mm -hmm. in one of her drawer closet, uh, dresser drawers under some stuff. There's three or four letters from the, this lady, best from, postmarked in New Orleans with a return address. I didn't say anything, I wrote it down and I wrote her a letter. And I'm your son, you know, blah, blah, just like on TV. And uh, when you answer back, I gave her the name and address of a fellow right here in Buckhead, Bobby, Bobby Sanders on Brook, Brookwood Drive. And I put that address on there. So when the letter came to me and we wrote back and forth, couple of times. Then one day my stepmother got me to one and said, I know what you're doing. <laughs> what? <laughs> she said, I know you're getting mail. That mail is not from Bobby Sanders because it's postmarked St. Louis. <laughs> and she knew that's where the, I didn't think about the return address not matching the postmark. <laughs> what did I say about if he gets too soon old? <laughs> and so what I did was simply give him a different address, a buddy of mine up the street, and I got my mail there. And I kept that up. I got a job in a filling station and started getting the mail delivered to the filling station. And I didn't see her till I was at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and she took the train up from New Orleans, and we met at the platform. Mother, son, you know, just, you know, <laughs> just like in the movies. And uh, then I didn't see her again. That was the first time I'd ever seen her in my life, except when I was a baby. 
And then I next saw in Los Angeles when I got out of the Army and I went from Camp Stoneman down to Los Angeles and stayed two weeks with her. So we got a queen. She never married again, stayed, uh, just bounced around, lived by herself. Uh, well, that isn't quite true. She, she had three or four boyfriends over the years. <laughs> my, my sister Ghetto was pretty critical of that. But anyway. But that sparked your interest in genealogy. Oh, oh, I, I lost, you know, I the lost whole, the reason I got on that was genealogy. Yes, thank you, Becky. Well, the whole French connection. See, my daughter has to keep me straight. <laughs> <clears throat> I decided, to, I'd asked my mother, you know, who were your parents? She told me about Agatha, Agatha. Where did Agatha get the crazy name like that? That's just a nickname. Oh, in France, you hear it all the time. Oh, okay. So uh, my dad never talked about, I knew my grandparents who built a house right here in Buckhead, but I didn't know anybody else, where they came from. I didn't know if I was, where. So I decided I'd find out. Now, here we are 100 years later, I've got over 7,000 names in my computer, and I've got my Allens and every branch all the way back into the 15, even 1400s. Wow. Nobody famous or anything. Not, it's not an ego trip, just curiosity. And then when I was, other people would send me information after I, uh, it's, uh, uh, I gave it to Family Tree Maker, which is a company that does mm -hmm. And they, and they merged with Ancestry.com some way or other. And now I get people seeing it on that, I, all 7,000 names. Are, and then they'll write me. I get inquired all the time. I was telling Rick I got one, another one the other day from a fellow named James Henry Allen in New Zealand of all places. Then I got one from a lady in Australia the other day. I've got them from Austria and Germany and England, Scotland. You're going to have to make a lot of trips. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to travel, though. I, I don't travel anymore. I'm diabetic, and I, and I, I have weak spells sometimes. I'm, I'm all right now, but, I mean, it's made me kind of gun-shy about traveling. Well, you've led a remarkable life, sir, and we definitely want to I made it to 90. Telling this story. Yeah. I feel like very egotistical saying all this to you, and, and but but no, this has been they great. told me that's according to what she said. That's what you wanted to hear. So okay, absolutely. You want my life story? I'll, yeah, I'll absolutely. give it to you. You'll be sorry you asked. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> the, the, the trick is not to turn him on. Is to turn. It. In fact, I told Becky, waiting for you all outside. I said, now look, if I go on and on and on. Give me a signal, you know. Becky said, "You mean like this?" <laughs> no, I said, "Cut me off, cause I'll, I'll be thinking I'm rolling along, doing good." No, you've been great. Yeah. yeah. For years, you wouldn't talk about your military service. We didn't hear about it. Well, uh, felt this way. I don't feel like I was a soldier. I didn't ever shot at anybody, and uh, what adventures I had were just playful adventures, like getting caught and all that. Uh, Nothing. I didn't do anything. I wasn't any kind of hero, uh, and I was always bashful, and still am about. And I'm a little bashful about doing this because I feel like you want true veterans, fighting veterans, not just peacetime veterans like me. You are. And then I get to thinking about it. Well, now just a minute. I went ahead and enlisted, and I did whatever they told me to do, and went wherever they sent me. I, they could have sent me anywhere in Korea. Anything could have happened. It didn't happen, but uh, you expose yourself, so don't don't you know be too harsh on yourself. And the fact that nothing ever happens just my good luck. <laughs> I that's, guess that's a good way to look at it because you served and serving even in peace time. I did everything they asked me to do. It's a dangerous business. So yeah, you, you served. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, so sir. I've always been a little hesitant to join any of the veterans things. Yeah. Rick was in Vietnam, and and he's tried to get me to go, and I feel a little little bashful about that. I don't want to stand around there with truth fighting men. And what did you do? Well, uh, I sorted mail over in Korea. <laughs> 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 Sounds like me. Rick needs to be in that chair too. Soon. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Except he doesn't have all the wild kill, tales. Kill 700 years of family history. That, that, that would time. be good. <laughs> I brought my whole notebook of my whole family story. Oh, he did I, bring it. <laughs> well, we can talk I've got 43 that. pages, and I, I wrote it uh, called My Life. And so when I die, my children will have the whole, uh, everything that I've told you, really. Excellent. I could have just read this, just given you this. It's just a repeat of what I've told you. Well, I'm glad we well, there's a map of you. Korea oh, a more fun this way. and uh, yes. my birth certificate. And yeah, we can so capture that, these things on the camera. Uh, oh, the okay. Of, uh, You're welcome to photograph along. anything you want to. In for sure. Yeah. Okay, so and, and there's all kind of photos in there that I took mostly over in Korea. Yeah, we want to sit down and uh, talk with you about some of those, but uh, let's... Uh, this is in front of the house over here on oh, Lakeview. Way. Isn't that sweet? And the reason I've got it is we're going to go by there when we leave here. Okay. We're going to go by there, and if the owner happens to be out in the front yard, I'm going to stop and tell him why I'm <laughs> stopping and taking a picture, because my grandparents built this house. And I'm going to say, to prove it, here's my picture standing in front of it. <laughs> so he won't call the police on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, we definitely want to thank you very much for your time, for well, your Well, thank you for your interest. And for and your story. It's uh, wonderful that you're doing all this for the sake of the veteran community. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. And thank you. Thanks. Fifty years from now, people will be even more appreciative. That's the way I feel about genealogy in this. It doesn't mean anything now, but Becky's grandchildren and great-grandchildren, someday, 50 years from now, they'll read all about their people back, you know, 100 years ago. And they won't have to go by. There's a picture of a 31 Chevrolet. <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay, Thank sir. you very Thank much. You. You're Thank quite you. welcome.